In this episode, we talk with an artist who has literally carved her own path. But not art as you know it, a far more dangerous game. One with teeth and sharp edges, eager to bite, where one wrong move can cost you a limb. The world of chainsaw carving. This is The Outliers, Griffin Ramsey. Griffin, so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you so much for coming on the show. You are the first chainsaw artist I've ever met. My first question is just like, how the hell does one even become a chainsaw artist? It's actually kind of challenging, I mean, depending where you live. Some areas have a lot of chainsaw carvers and then it's maybe something where you can go and meet with them and apprentice. But even that takes effort and convincing someone to let you move into their shop and hang around, you know? So it's not easy. A lot of time and personal expense went into learning, like as far as flying to events and investing in the materials and the tools. Because you can't just go and take like a chainsaw carving class usually. Why chainsaw? You know, like if it's so hard to get into, like what were your art experiences that led up to that? And like with so many different mediums out there, why did you decide that working with the chainsaw was going to be your medium? Well, I was surprised when it happened too, because like that is, it is so random. But if I look back at my childhood, I grew up in Oregon in a logging area, so chainsaws were around. And on the Oregon coast, it was kind of a tourist thing to have chainsaw carving. So I was exposed to it as a kid, going and visiting the, the Oregon coast with my family. My grandfather whittled, and my dad said the family were like loggers. So I had like, I guess, a little bit of early exposure. And I remember at a young age seeing my first totem pole and deciding that someday I wanted to try it. But it was just a little seed in the back of my mind until I lived in Texas about 30 years later and actually just started to try, jump into it. Wow, so you didn't really even get into chainsaw art until you were in your 30s? Yeah, I was 30, 31 in 2011. And that's when I started. What was your art experiences before getting into chainsaw? Well, I've been an artist for as long as I can remember as far as how I found my place in the world. And it was sort of how I would make friends in school, I was helping people on their projects. And so it started off, I think my first thing I carved was styrofoam. And then it became a lot more solid. Tell me a little more. I feel like that's such a big moment. Like, <laughs> uh, surprisingly, not surprisingly, I was real pissed off at the time. And chainsaw carving and chainsaws in general are the perfect tool if you're in a bad mood. And if you want to express yourself, that's the, you'll express yourself with a chainsaw. So you were just like, I'm hardcore, like I'm pissed off and I want to like carve some shit up. Yeah, well, I wanted to try it. And at the time I was launching a YouTube channel and in that moment, um, Gears of War 3 was coming out and there's that chainsaw gun, the Lancer or whatever in the game. And so I was like, well, this is a good time to try chainsaw carving just once. It was only gonna be a one-off for this, to make this first YouTube video, I wanted something with impact. And I thought there's nothing more impactful really than chainsaw. And so I wanted to try it. I decided to try it once. I didn't expect it to be an addiction, you know, and then that take me on this path around the world of chainsaw carving. That is so badass. I love to hear that because there's so many people just wondering like this massive plan, they want it all designed for their life. And then you just have like a few of these experiences that just like lights a fire. That is kind of my experience, kind of how that journey goes though. And I feel like with my creative life, there's been a migration, but no skill, even the things you don't think are useful, like making pizzas when you're in your youth or whatever, you know, whatever, anything you do in your life, it's somehow that thing comes around again. You know, and, it, and it's surprising sometimes a few random things that don't seem correlated that later you end up making a big career out of or whatever. You know, like, I think that's so interesting about life and our personal little journeys. Yeah, I think that's incredibly beautiful because so many people, and tell me if you can relate to this, it's like they'll go down this path and find out that's not what they want to do, but they've invested so much time and money. Oh, that's so hard too, that realization. When you're so in and you're like, I'm losing interest, no. <laughs> yeah, and then my question is, do you just continue to go down a path that you know is wrong? Um, I have in the past forced it for longer than I wanted to. And so I pay attention now when I start to feel burned out. And for me, I have a lot of projects. So I, chainsaw carving is what I'm known for, but I'm kind of entrepreneurial juggler of things. And so I have several hustles. And when I start to feel hit a wall with something, I, I jump onto the other thing to keep the momentum going and not get burned out. Because I am really, I think boredom is the most stressful thing on the planet. <laughs> so. I think going into business and then sometimes dipping out of business and changing business for me is sort of a fluid, becomes sort of fluid. It doesn't always have to be this big dramatic decision that I'm now considered this. I love to hear that though because 
fluidity is like you're never anything that you do or don't want to be. You're just like what you are at the moment, right? Well, and I think the whole beauty of branding is that you can at any moment decide to redefine yourself. But the other side of that is you kind of have to define yourself or other people do it for you. And it's surprising if somebody, you might start to get more jobs and things that you don't want if you aren't careful with how you describe yourself, you know? What I would love to hear is like, how do you approach making your pieces? Do you sketch them out? Do you like sculpt them first? Do you just start like carving? Well, it really depends on the job. And um, so if somebody wants something in particular, you know, um, then I will go seek out a material that matches it the best or could accomplish it the most uh, easily. And I'll find the material that suits the project. If I find just an amazing log or I somehow get gifted some amazing piece of material, I don't necessarily have uh, an idea of what it's going to be used for yet, but if it is really unusual, a lot of times the wood itself defines what it's going to be or it kind of tells you if that it sounds kind of weird, but like it, it's a conversation with the material. Wood, especially because it's this organic, constantly moving, it's never done moving and shifting around, you know. You know, every little piece of wood is different. And what you're encountering every, when you're working with it, even if you have a plan and you're trying to like take your sketch and make this wood into that, the wood is doing what it's gonna do and you might find a rotten hole or a big crack or some weird inconsistency that you're gonna have to work with or work around. So um, I try to be adaptive. Now what boggles my mind is being in construction, like working with a saw is always dangerous, right? And this is like a circular saw on the ground, flat surface, like you're far away from it, you're pushing it, you're very calculated. I mean, you're twisting and bending and you're up on a ladder. And moving around. Yeah, and, and I mean, the material's heavy as hell. You know, tell me about like, all the complications about safety. Have you ever hurt yourself? Like all that kind of stuff. I've hurt myself here and there. Uh, not so much on the chainsaw, but um, angle grinder many times, die grinders. Uh, my biggest fear usually is tripping. Because you you get in the zone, you're cutting all these chunks are underfoot. It doesn't matter how well you're holding your chainsaw if you trip and fall on it, you know? So you, I'm always having to kind of half aware, kick all the material out from under my feet. The, my worry is then just getting so much into the sculpting zone where I'm just like, blind to the world where I start to not notice those kinds of things but um I let my leg on fire one time at a carving show like it's there's been a few few incidents but I've been lucky so far uh <laughs> it is awesome. dangerous I don't forget it's dangerous I've never lost respect for the chainsaw being incredibly dangerous well it's powerful and it is awesome to feel that powerful and as an artist you know what other art form do you get that sense of power also immediacy like to be able to turn something so solid into your idea so quickly is really powerful and exciting how does it feel like being in a group of people you know they're like oh so what do you do you know how does it feel like having the coolest job in the room no like, that is something right like no that's something like I was uh, I used to be in the Rotary Club which is you know all of the very grown-up grown-ups of people that are very grown up with their jobs and everything in there but and I find that no matter how much more money someone may make or like how like grandia that ultimately the conversation stops if if you bring up chainsaw carving a little bit you know but I'm actually careful not to all the time because I don't always want to get it you know if I don't want to have a conversation about it for a while I'll just say artist but if you want to steal the focus and talk about yourself for a long time, you can bring up chainsaw carving. That's awesome. That's so <laughs> cool to always have in your back pocket, you know? It has been very, it has helped me stand out. Yeah, I don't know. I, I am attached to being a chainsaw carver. I love it. It feels like, just feels good to do. Like running the saw, making the cuts. One thing I love about sculpting, chainsaw carving is that your sculpture are your full body movements. So you're, you're, you're circling your, every cut is like my whole body is involved in it. And so it's satisfying in that sense too, of just like, I feel my art, like it's, it is my movements. You know, I really connected to the piece at the end because I've been like dancing with it. But then what's cool is you have like a physical representation of all that you just did. It's like a record. Yeah. And, yeah. and in my experience, building a house is exactly the same way. It's like, you're, let's say you're a stock trader, you're badass, you have all these numbers in a bank, it's like digital, you don't have anything to like touch and feel. Touch is everything, and honestly smell too, and I'm sure you relate to this cutting boards and stuff, the smell of like wood dust, and I just love the smell of it. What have you learned 
about yourself. This journey has been crazy. You've done office jobs, you've done all of these different things. Now into Chainsaw and still, you're defining who you are. Like, what have you learned about yourself in this journey? I guess this society really expects us to focus and focus and specialize. They reward specialists over generalists. They get paid better, even if a generalist can do more and often is the innovator in the group that comes in and says, hey, let's borrow from this and borrow from this and we'll put it together. You know, like, but we pay specialists more. But for some people, you can't, you can't even become one. It's soul killing, right? And so I think to acknowledge that there's different types of people and that there, if you feel this sort of inability to focus or that you want to do all these different things and try these different things, to not punish yourself or to hold yourself in a, in a focused sort of narrow viewpoint for too long, I don't think it's good for you. Like, I don't ever want to quit carving, but I also never want to quit making pizza, and I quit making pizza, you know, 20-something years ago. You know, like, there's, I kind of want everything to come, to still be in play and possible. And here, the, to the point about hobby, and, and I, I almost cringe anytime I hear that word applied to anything or even anybody's interests. I hate the word, I think the whole world, the, the word hobby is insulting to me on every level. If you care about it, it's a passion. How, where the money comes from, isn't really anyone's business. If, some, if, you, if you're an artist or you're a creative and you care the most about your little miniatures you're painting or whatever, that's what you care about more than your nine to five job that you, you don't have to define yourself as this nine to five job. Like you don't have to call that job what you do. Where the, what you do I think is what you give a shit about. And where the money comes from is, it varies, you know, in that passion and out of that passion either way, you know. Well, and what you're talking about is fulfillment. You literally cannot put a value on that. Because you're someone, you know, just like, like when I talked about you being a chainsaw artist and describing your profession, it like lit you up. There's like this sense of validation. It is very satisfying. Yeah. It is the very, it's a very, very, very satisfying thing to do, chainsaw carving. <laughs> it's tiring and it is challenging to learn how to do it because where do you even go to learn it? But I think that's partly why I'm so proud, partly why I'm so proud of it too. I can't just go take a community college class because I have a slight interest in it. It took a lot of work and a lot of jumping in head first to a terrifying thing to even learn how to do it. And I'm, kinda, I'm proud of just the effort it took. What I want to end with is, what is your advice to someone that wants to follow an unconventional or undefined path? Like maybe they want to switch gears in their life and follow some of the passions that you spoke of. Well, that is an open-ended question and it depends on a lot of factors. And honestly, when it comes down to success, I think success is really arbitrary and it's often based on luck. And so you can't really plan for luck though, you can make yourself a luckier person. And part of that is having your eyes open to begin with, you know, and in general, trying to think positively. And so I think anytime you invest in yourself and you take a leap of faith in a direction that you, a curiosity you really want to satisfy, you're taking a step in the direction of making yourself luckier.